uh, just three or four words. The first one to welcome you. Welcome you to Portugal. In the next uh, three weeks, you will, you're going to discover Portugal. And you'll be amazed. We are a great country. Not just uh, the sea to swim, not just or to surf, not just the food and the wine, not just the nature and the heritage and the monuments, but the people, our hospitality, the way we are. And uh, we are that way for almost uh, 900 years. Sometimes when uh, paying visits, state visits to abroad, I used to meet uh, the heads of states and prime ministers from different countries, and they were telling me, you know, our country, my country, my country. I said, of course, I, we know it. For instance, uh, United States. I explained to the President of the United States that uh, when they were born, we already had uh, 500 years. <laughs> and, uh, and they toasted, and they toasted that independence. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and they, and, and he didn't know, he didn't know, they toasted, <laughs> he, uh, he didn't know that they toasted the founding fathers at the time of their independence with the Madeira wine, with the Portuguese wine. They loved it. The, the, the English that were our oldest allies and that we, in a sense, abandoned to support the independence of the United States. Well, they would prefer, they would rather have Oporto wine. So the United States chose Madeira wine. Anyway, two Portuguese wines. And then, of course, when I go to China, where part of my family is living in Shenzhen, uh, and I have to explain to President Xi uh, that we are in China for 500 years. So we know everything about the Chinese, and they should know everything about the Portuguese. We were in Malaysia first to get there. First to get to Brazil, first to get Europeans to get to Japan. Many words in Japanese look alike the Portuguese words. Thank you is aligato, in Portuguese is obrigado. So, as they don't say the R the way we do, they said aligato. And the world is, is, is made of these small things, they show that we were, in a sense, pioneers. At the end of the 14th century, as we had a very strong neighbor, today called Spain, we had just one way out, it was the sea. So we returned to the sea and decided to cross the oceans. We went to Africa and to Brazil and to Latin America and the whole. We went to India by sea and to the Pacific, and so on, so on, so on. We, we were some of the first to do it. Then the Spanish, then the Dutch, then the French, then the, the British. Finally, well, they remained, we, we remained, and then uh, we left, because happily there were the independences, and uh, the old colonial empires were over. But while doing it, why did we do it? Because at that time, we were the best. We were the best in astronomy. We were the best in a naval building. We were the best in what concerned anything that had to deal with oceans, in geography. And when we were not the best, as Portugal was very wealthy by then, we invited the best to come to Portugal. The Spanish, the Italians, uh, uh, those that, uh, the Muslims, uh, the Jewish, all those that were studying and knowing what we didn't know, they came to Portugal. That means we did it because we had innovation, science, technology. We were the best at that time.
That's why we changed the world in a first kind of globalization. This means what we already know, you do know, that what changes the world <laughs> is knowledge, is knowledge. Knowing more and better. That's the difference. There are countries that are very poor. They have no gas, no oil, no nothing. They are wealthy countries because they have good universities, very good education, very good science and technology. They achieved it. And other countries that have raw materials, commodities, and so on and so on, but they don't have education, healthcare, uh, uh, innovation environment. So they are behind the others. And that's why it's so important what you're going to do for the next three weeks. Because he was supposed to be brilliant. I was told they are genius. I said, no, too many genius. No, only by chance they could meet together. All of a sudden, so many genius. But no, no, I was told, no, they are really very, very, very good. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. But there is a difference between a, a genius, a lonesome genius, as a kind of an island. Nobody's an island in this world. Or to be net with someone else. And to get to compete with someone else and also to cooperate with someone else. That is even better than we are. I was a good student. I was good, otherwise I wouldn't be a professor. Anyway, but uh, there, were, there were other very good students. And I used to, to study together with students that were better than I was, and other than were not so good as I was. And that was that mix that was good for me. I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot from it. So your experience during these days, uh, learning with people coming mostly from Berkeley, I think, but from many universities and from, uh, from Google and so on and so on and so on, and personal experience is unique. Unique. You'll be getting to know people you'll never forget for the rest of your lives. You'll be in touch with them forever. I have a son that at the end of his studies in economics, then he took an MBA abroad. He was even in Singapore by then, which was very rare for Portuguese 20 years ago, something like that. And then he worked abroad. The world belongs to you. No longer we can conceive borders. You are crossing the borders. We are crossing. Our knowledge is crossing the borders. And so is science and technology. And the net that came from that period, a long time ago, remained. Is there. Whenever it's needed, professionally, personally, scientifically, academically, that is the difference. Well, a second question you can ask me, well, you spoke of Portugal 500 years ago and today. What do you think as a president of Portugal? Well, you expect a president of a country to say that the country is wonderful. And, uh, but in this case, we are very good in many, many fields. Not all of them, of course. But uh, we go on being pioneers. The same curiosity that made us travel around the world and have half of our people abroad, we have around 10 million and a half in Portugal, and 12, 11, 13 million abroad in 178 countries. The United Nations has, I don't know, 193. So we are not yet in 15 countries, not yet. But being there with huge communities, the United States, in Canada, all over Europe, in Asia, in the uh, well, Pacific, in, in Latin America, well, in Africa, of course, well, 
means that we go on being very curious. We want to be curious. We want to know more. That's why next year we're going to have here in Lisbon the United Nations Conference on the Oceans. Because when we speak of something to discover, there is always the space, of course. And there is the cyberspace, of course. And then the oceans, the sea. We know so little about it. So little. And for us, it's vital. We have not only what you're going to know now, to get to know, but also Madeira and, and Azores, that are islands in the middle of the Atlantic, with a huge continental platform that goes to, to Canada and the United States. We are neighbors of the United States and Canada, speaking of uh, continental platforms, although being so far away as it seems. And then we have a Web Summit every year in the beginning of November. And you have heard of it. With so many thousands of startups from all over the world. It was tough because it used to be in Dublin. Then it came to Lisbon. It was tough to keep it in Lisbon for another 10 years. This means that we have a movement. Many Portuguese universities are here with their groups, with their delegations. And they know what I'm, I'm speaking of. At this movement, we can call it digital revolution that uh, started 10, 20, 25 years ago, or less than that in several countries. But is everywhere. It's changing the face of the world. It's one of your challenges, digital revolution. It's going to change the way you produce, the, the way you work. The way you work, you'll be working in the future. The way the society will be organized in the future, structured in the future. Education will be changing, is changing, and will change even quicker. And then another challenge we're facing enthusiastically, climate change. We think there is climate change. I know that some of my friends, heads of states or prime ministers, still doubt about it. Well, either because they are too old or because really they are very absent-minded. But you just look at the reality and, and you discover it every day, every day. I mean, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in France. Yesterday I was in Paris too. Well, but yesterday it was mild, strange, mild, even cool in Paris in the middle of July. But three weeks ago, in the beginning of July, end of, uh, of June, wow, it was a tropical weather. And in Portugal, in the south of Europe, we were not, we were not freezing, but it was cold in the evening. Things are changing. No seasons, no traditional seasons. For me, just the same, because I swim every day in the sea. So. I swim at a temperature of 10 Celsius, 12 Celsius, 14 Celsius, well, and 20 Celsius, or even 24. Uh, but this is a reality we must face together. We cannot say, well, it's a national problem, you know. There is a border, so the change won't come, won't cross the border. That, that doesn't exist. It's another challenge. So, climate change, digital revolution, disruption in traditional labor structures, migrations, migrations. Because people now, they migrate. I still recall a meeting. It was when, it was in uh, Colombia. We were meeting heads of state and government of uh, the so-called Ibero-American countries. So Latin America, Spain, Portugal. We were there. There was a president always calling, calling, receiving calls. What happened? It was the year of uh, the Leaping Games in Brazil. 
some workers that had been working in Brazil to build the stadiums and so on. So they crossed the whole continent. They were arriving at Panama in less than one month, several weeks. This isn't used to happen. I mean, migrations exist in between neighboring countries or regions. Now it, it happens all of a sudden. Going from uh, Central Africa to Northern Africa, crossing the, the Mediterranean. Going from Southern America to, to, to Central America and being not too far away from the United, United States. This is happening on account of war, on account of inequalities, on account of uh, these realities, social economic realities, that do exist and change the life of millions and millions of people. And they'll decide to vote with their feet. They just leave. And they look for what they think is better. United States is better, is better. Europe is better, is better. Let us look for it. It's a new challenge. A challenge that really must be solved, creating conditions of sustained development in countries that don't have it. And it's impossible to have them living without that expectation. It's impossible. Well, and then uh, demography. M mo many of you come from countries, young countries, very young countries. But for instance, Europe, Western Europe is aging quickly, aging. And aging means problems, healthcare problems, means uh, social <coughs> security problems, but means mostly different uh, way of facing the future. Because a young society is a society with dynamics, with a perception of change and the will of change. An older society is a society where it's very, very difficult to change. I told you, I'm, I, I, I'm swimming every day. I used to swim one hour, one hour and a half a day. Now I'm swimming, depends. Winter time, let us say, 18, 25 minutes a day. Well, that's aging. Aging is being slow and slower in adjusting to reality and not anticipating the change, the social, the cultural, the political, the economic change. And when a society is aging, this means this society needs to introduce factors of youth in it. It's impossible for such a society to say, no, we cannot accept migration. It's stupid. It means we're going to, to die, closing the borders. <laughs> react in a very xenophobic and very hyper-nationalist way because we don't want to change. With the younger generations, new ideas, with, with patterns coming from different places all around the world. Well, in a sense, you are in a country, you'll be discovering it, that is a platform among cultures, civilizations, continents, and oceans. We are that way. That's why a Portuguese is, is the Secretary General of the United Nations. He was accepted by the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, the British, and the French. Did he say something different for, to, to any one of them to have their vote? And uh, the huge I would say the acclamation of the rest of the General Assembly, Afri African and Asian countries, European countries, no. 
he just knew how to understand those he had to meet and speak with. And this is a key point. There is no innovation without dialogue. There is no innovation without tolerance. There is no innovation being egocentric. There is no innovation <clears throat> if you are not humble enough to accept someone else's ideas. And it's difficult sometimes in periods of crisis not to be too egoistic, not to want to shut the borders and look at yourself alone. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's the point. You'd, you are here. You studied. You won, in a sense. You are winners for what you did till now. But you just represent a minority of all those that belong to your generation. A huge majority didn't have the chance you had. Millions in Africa, millions in Asia, thousands and thousands in the Americas, thousands in Europe. They could not afford their families. They could not afford an account of wars, an account of starving, an account of misery, an account of poverty, an account of clashes, an account of, well, whatever. So you must understand, you were privileged in a sense, to be where you are. And those that receive more than others must give to all the others much more than they can afford to give. Whenever you think, which is very common with my students, it used to be, of being competitive, you must be. But cooperative, you must be. You must think that uh, you have, uh, I would say, an ethical, or moral, or civic, or citizen uh, uh, duty of thinking this way. I can change the world. And there are thousands or millions of people at my age, they don't have that opportunity. They cannot be in Portugal for three weeks getting to know so many people from all around the world. They cannot travel as I do. They could not study as I did. They cannot research as I do. They cannot have the idea of conceiving <clears throat> and, and putting together people to to have new startups and uh, new innovation hubs, they can't. They can't. They are not far away from us. You just cross the street and you find a couple of them, they will never do it in their lifetime. And thinking that way, you understand how your task is also a social commitment. You must be committed to change the world, to make the most of your opportunity. I was elected President of the Republic. When uh, we started, we were, I don't know how many. When I was a student in primary school, <laughs> girls only had a period of three years of study. Then they left. Boys, four. It was in 55. Then, in the 60s, turned to be six years. And slowly, nine years. And then it came to 12 years. But I looked around, and my best friends were living. They couldn't afford to go on. And some of them were better than I was. So whenever I think of my mission as head of state, I think of those that I meet very often in the street. And I asked them and I said, well, you know, I'm working um, uh, well in a factory. 
well, you know, now I'm no longer, I'm no longer working, because I'm retired. And how did you retire? Well, with this kind of disease and this and this. Your life was it. Well, no, it was a very tough, tough life. And so on and so on and so on. So, please, if you are really the genius I was told, be those genius. But think of those genius that can't afford to be in Portugal for three weeks because you'll be changing the world also for them. For you and for them. Thank you. <laughs>